Um, okay, my name is uh, the first one here, Stuart Riesga. I'm from the mathematics department. I would like to talk about work with uh, my uh, PhD student, Martin Oppenier, uh, on a project which was funded by NLR. Uh, Peter Seisma was from NLR, Bob Martijn uh, is a uh, numerical analysis from our department, and Bernard Lazarums was a student, a uh, graduate student. Martin is now in Delft, he works there. Peter Seisma has his own company, he's also not at NLR anymore. Bob is uh, retired and Bernard is in Stockholm working on a PhD at KTH, so I'm the only one here to, uh, to tell you this. So, um, Since I have about three stories to tell, uh, and uh, uh, they were taken together into one, uh, I thought it might be wise to give once in a while a sort of uh, summary so that you see where we are and uh, what the idea is. So first I would like to tell what I'm going to tell and then I'm going to tell it and then I will <laughs> tell what I told. So more or less mm, some of the information should have become familiar for them by, for you by, now, by then. So we will consider acoustic modes in uh, ducts with radial mean flow and temperature gradients. Um, and since flow is usually in the axial direction, it's natural that most of the gradients are in crosswise direction. And um, we have boundary conditions, I will show you why in a minute, uh, of Hamel's resonator type, and they vary. They vary actually. So it's not a fixed, fixed boundary condition, but we have to deal with a, a, a varying condition. And um, yeah, the usual way, the usual approach, unless you do it full-fledged numerical, of course, uh, is to work with mode matching, and that works well, at least for uniform flow. Uh, question is, how does it here for non-uniform non flow where you have radial modes and temperature gradient? Um, can we? apply a slowly varying mode approximation if the variation of the impedance is not too strong, not too abrupt. Um, we will show that this works well unless the Helmholtz resonator has some resonance halfway, which is yeah, inherent for Helmholtz resonator, so it's something we, um, well, we will see. And then, because in the end we will need and we will want mode matching, we are going to uh, dress up our mode matching method, not the classic one, but we will devise a new mode matching method based on uh, exact integrals of modes, and these exact integrals are non-trivial because they do not exist in the literature for this uh, sort of problems, and uh, uh, it will be shown to work very, very well, and in a way too good to be true or not. Uh, and it's a summary of two publications uh, in AWA papers, and one of the publications is now busy being reviewed, and I hope that the reviewers are a little bit working harder than they seem to do until now. Um, okay, this is the, uh, well, sort of um, the sections. Background and motivation comes in a minute, then we talk about triple brown modes. Triple brown modes are just the modes you have here. Triple brown studied them for the first time, but it's it's a name of a person. It's uh, it's, it's two names with one person. So, uh, and then we are going to see what options we have for varying Z, and then we are going to uh, to look at the options first, the slowly varying, and then the mode matching methods, and then the conclusions. Okay, background and motivation. The original motivation was a uh, problem from Airbus that. Uh, in the back of the aircraft, you have a uh, so-called APU, the auxiliary power unit. And the auxiliary power unit is uh, a small engine uh, which uh, works, which produces uh, power for, to start the main engines and uh, to uh, air conditioning and electricity and, and, and more of that. And um, the engine is small and therefore not so very important acoustically unless, unless the aircraft is waiting on the ramp, that is, uh, where, where the passengers come in and out, 
uh, and all the other engines are off, and this engine is still on, then all of a sudden it's a very annoying noise, and uh, making uh, more noise than allowed according to normal regulations. So Airbus would like to know how to reduce the noise of this uh, engine, and this engine has special properties which are not in common engine. Common engines, uh, there is uh, the inlet is more important than the exhaust, and you have here uh, hot air, so you have temperature gradients and, um, uh, and, and mean flow. So there are similarities with common engines, but there are also special things, and one of these special things is the temperature gradient. So uh, we are going to study some propagation and attenuation in the exhaust duct of the APU. Now, uh, of course, we would like to model everything, and that is what Airbus already did, but for the modeling, you have to solve the complete Navier Stokes uh, equations, etc., etc., and you know better than I that if you want to solve that, uh, it's not a good basis for design and optimization calculations. Then you have to do one calculation per, per day or so, or, or maybe one per week if you, uh, if you uh, have very high standards. And um, so they were interested in a way to have a quick, faster model to have uh, ways for optimization. So what did we do? We have the following problem. We have the problem of a straight duct, circular hollow, and non-uniform parallel mean flow. It is actually varying, of course, because, because of viscosity, the boundary layer will thicken. But we will mm, ignore that for the moment. We say, OK, the duct is not very long, so the variation in the actual direction is, is moderate. It's not so strong. And we will start with ignoring this. Uh, but we do have strong temperature gradients, also not uh, actually varying. And why is that? Well, there is cooling air coming from here. And this cooling air creates uh, uh, strange temperature gradients. Cool air, hot air here, and, uh, and so on. And um, we have a segmented liner. This liner is in a tube in a sort of conical, in a conical section. So the, 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 the liner varies in thickness, and since the liner consists of Helmholtz resonators, also the acoustic properties of the Helmholtz resonator vary in uh, along the line. So this is where the actual variation comes from. This is not a bad idea, because an actual varying liner gives you a broader spectrum to uh, attenuate. So maybe it is just fortunate. Um, but at any rate, there is variation. And then, of course, we start with order equations and perfect gas assumptions, uh, and we do not have, uh, well, the uh, thermodynamic problems that you have, uh, you have here in your project. Uh, at least we didn't consider them uh, yet, probably upstream here, maybe some. But uh, uh, everything is considered isentropic uh, in the acoustic part. Okay, so we start with the modeling and numerical methods. Um, when we have, oh, I can use that on distance. So, uh, when we, for perturbations of a parallel mean flow, and the parallel mean flow is varying in the x direction, but it's uh, is, is flowing in the x direction, but it's it's only varying in the crosswise direction. Um, we have the linearized order equations, and for modes of this type. And since the uh, mean flow is, co is, is, is constant in that direction, you can assume that, that uh, you have modes in the, uh, of, of e to the power i k x um, uh, dependence. Of modes of this type, you can uh, yeah, convert your linearized order equations into a sort of wave equation. And we call this generalized Pritmo Brown equation. But it's yeah, it's a sort of wave equation on a cross-section. Uh, and if you look carefully, you see that when this is constant and this is constant, it's no more than the Helmholtz equation. This is convective. This is the, the Doppler factor, which uh, will show uh, at various occasions. Now, for a circular duct, you can go even one step further. For a circular duct, you can make uh, assumption that everything is varying uh, according to uh, Fourier modes in circumferential direction. 
So if you assume then that your mode uh, has a e to the power i m theta dependence, then this can be further simplified into this equation. And this is the classic or ordinary triple Brown equation. And this is no more than the Bessel equation if this term is zero and, and this becomes constant. Uh, boundary conditions, well, we have this, uh, this liner here and at the interface we will uh, assume that there uh, exists an impedance and you have mean flow here, not necessarily zero at the wall and um, therefore the boundary condition for an impedance should be converted in the ingard myers boundary condition where this extra term takes care of the refraction in the boundary layer which is vanishing but there is a boundary layer and you have their Snell's law and Snell's law takes care of, uh, well, of uh, the, this, this term takes care of the Snell's law effect at the refraction at the uh, vanishing boundary layer. Okay, so what do we have? We have this Friedman brown equation, we have boundary conditions and regularity at the center and we have a number k which is unknown. Well, this number k has to be found because it is part of the problem and altogether we get an eigenvalue problem in k with a countable set of modal solutions. Uh, we count them with mu, mu is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. in right direction and left direction if you like and the eigenfunctions are uh, called this and the eigenvalue, the modal actual wave number is this k number. We will come back to that later but this is the essential problem. Now, this has to be calculated numerically. This uh, equation is far too difficult, if, uh, except for the simplified cases of everything uniform, then you have uh, solutions of the Bessel functions. But in general, it has to be calculated numerically. And uh, uh, we have done no attempt to do that in any uh, clever way. We uh, took that uh, based on uh, standard software, which is already in the order of 25 or 30 years old, so uh, practically all the errors are now gone, and uh, uh, that uh, numerical uh, software is called Call New. It's an updated version of Call Sys, and Call Sys comes from collocated system. Uh, that is the background. So we write our eigenvalue problem as a boundary value problem by adding an equation k prime is zero, which looks funny, but it is the way to make it a boundary a boundary value problem and uh, fix the uh, f and then we invoke this call new. This is uh, a year's work, I can tell you that of course. It's, uh, it's only half of the, uh, the slide but it's a year's work before you have everything running. But then you have an enormous powerful uh, set uh, where you can do everything with. Uh, well these are the, the properties that you can find in the, uh, in, in the manual of course. Uh, but for those who like to know uh, it is uh, very, very clever and very reliable. Uh, Nonlinear boundary value problem software package available in MATLAB. And then uh, to find the status, you, you, you have to uh, start at some solution, which you know, and then by small steps you go to the final solution that you want to have. Uh, why is that? Well, otherwise you can get any solution except the one you want. So you must have some kind of way to follow a path to the required so solution that, that you want. If you want a solution of the uh, third mode of something, in the, then you have to be able that you are still on the third mode. So uh, path following, including predictor corrector and automatic step size strategy is added to go from known solution, known solution of the Bessel functions, to the desired solution. Uh, this is an example of this path following. Here's path following only in the impedance, uh, but the path following is of course also in the uh, flow and the temperature gradient. Uh, and what you see here is, the, uh, is an impedance that varies from infinity to infinity, so from hard wall to hard wall. And at the same time you see the modes, the, the, the eigenvalues k, um, moving in the complex plane. They start at a hard, hard wall value. Uh, real cut-on modes and the cut-off modes imaginary and then you see they go from a hardball value to another hardball value from this hardball value to that one hardball value and if you run from bottom to top then you start here and you leave here the picture uh, to infinity over a so-called service wave uh, if you go from top to bottom 
then you will never pick up this, this solution, so you will have an empty space here in the end. So also the direction you trace that is important. Uh, but uh, well, these are details that I'm not going to talk about now further, but just to give you a slight idea what it takes to get at least a solution of this Brown equation by itself. Uh, here's some solutions. Um, the solutions are for particularly notoriously difficult case. And why is it difficult? They are eigenfunctions for upstream running modes of a, of a mean flow which has a, a, a curvature, a parabolic curvature. And what happens is that this is a case where the modes are at the wall exponentially small. So at the wall you have no idea how you to satisfy the boundary condition, this impedance. This impedance plays no role in fact at the wall. Uh, because the, the modes happen to be there exponentially small. Uh, that's just a, a, a bad case, a difficult test case. All the other cases are easier, but this is a difficult case. And we were interested to see that also these kind of cases were well covered, and they are well covered, except for the fact, how do you know that it is true? I mean, a computer can pr produce numbers, we know that, uh, but only one in a thousand times the number is correct. <laughs> and the question is, when is it correct? So you need some kind of... Yeah, I, I'm talking about the test phase. <laughs> no, we can't be general. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, now, since this problem is not available in any books and not available in any, in any uh, simple cases, we had to rely on approximations and for that, except for trivial cases, but the trivial case was already the starting point. So that, that makes no sense to start where you want to be. Uh, if you have it already, yeah? to, end, to, to end where you start. Uh, but there is a, we borrowed a test case from the, the quantum mechanical potential well problem, and uh, the Primal Brown equation is a, a bit similar to the Schrodinger equation, where this gamma part is, uh, yeah, is the potential well, and for high frequencies, we, uh, there is a so called quantization condition that the integral from the gamma, square root of the gamma, from a zero of gamma to another zero of gamma should be uh, one minus a half times pi. And if you find a k that satisfies this, uh, this condition, then you know at least your k, approximated for high frequencies. And uh, that was uh, amazing how well that worked in, uh, in these kind of test cases. So uh, we found that this was really convincing uh, for uh, uh, to, to believe that the results were really what they uh, seem to be. Um, okay, what are what are our options for the varying z? Because we are now still at the part of starting up to setting the building blocks for the house that we are going to build. How to calculate sound in this uh, APU? And uh, our options for varying z is uh, well, uh, maybe there are more, but for the for now there are two options. The general solution can be written as the sum over modes. Uh, so we have, uh, we found our modes, we calculate that uh, from the Pritmore Brown equation and we sum them until we have enough and we take the right side and the left running side and we can construct, we hope, uh, any solution. Now for a piecewise varying z, piecewise every five centimeter a new z, uh, there is the uh, mode matching method is the classic option. Uh, I come back to the mode matching method in detail, but for now I, I'm not going to talk too much about it because otherwise I have to do everything twice. Uh, so therefore I hope you have an idea what the mode matching method is. You calculate it in every section and then you connect at every interface and make sure that the pressure and velocities are continuous and in this way you calculate from one to the other the amplitudes. And this works very well, and uh, there, there was this uh, Bahamas program from NLR that we could use where it works very well for no flow and uniform flow condition, but mainly because there are exact solutions of the Prisma Brown equation that are the vessel functions, so that part is already covered. That is only a matter of uh, modlog. And the inner products, that is the integrals at the interfaces, are exactly available. They can be found in books from the 19th century and uh, we know what the uh, product is from two vessel functions uh, and then integrated. So that is a very convenient way to create your interfaces. And unfortunately, uh, 
we don't have that in, uh, for non-uniform flow. So questions for non-uniform flow is what can we do with slowly varying impedance? We, maybe we can solve already everything that we want to know. And can we improve the efficiency of the mode matching if we do something similar for the, not for the, 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 the Bessel functions, but for the general solutions of the prism round? And that is the, these are the steps that we are going to take in the following. First, I will talk about the slowly varying impedance, and then I will talk about the new mode matching method. Where are we? Okay. So first, the slowly varying Z. Slowly varying Z is, an, is a mode which is not a mode. A mode is, by definition, a solution of your wave, of your wave equation for uh, in a direction where uh, everything in one variable is constant. Boundary conditions are constant, uh, mean flow properties are constant, and then you can Fourier transform in that direction. In other words, you can make solutions of the type of something times e to the power i k x. And that's what we call a mode. It's a self-similar solution in that direction. But if we vary, for example, the impedance or the mean flow for that matter, or maybe the diameter or whatever, if we vary the properties, then modes do not exist by definition. But that was a problem they had already in the 1930s in the also quantum mechanics when you had waves that were traveling through slowly varying material. For example, light waves in slowly varying atmosphere or sound waves in slowly varying atmosphere. And in those days, clever people invented something where you take a, a, a wave type solution, which is almost a wave with an amplitude and a phase, but now the amplitude and the phase is slowly varying. So that on a short distance it looks like a wave, but on a longer distance you have something where the amplitude varies and you have something where the phase varies. And this approach, this approximation is, is called after the, the inventors WKB. Um, Kramer, I, I, I forgot, well, they, they're, they're Huh? You would remember in a minute. Yeah, yes. probably, yeah. <laughs> the important guy is the Dutch one. Kramer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, not necessarily, because uh, there's also Jeffrey sometimes associated with it. But anyway, WKB is after the... Well, the B is from the Frenchman, oh. a name which I never can pronounce. Kramer? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Wenzel is the, is the W. Wenzel. Yeah. Okay. Now we can do the same trick for something of acoustic waves that, uh, that, that live in a slowly varying environment. And in this case, uh, the slowly varying environment is uh, relatively simple, that is only the boundary condition. Uh, I'm not going to explain why uh, the slowly varying mean flow is not possible here, but um, uh, that is a next project. Um, suppose that the z has an inherent length scale which is much longer than the diameter. So it varies over this distance, for example, an impedance of 1 to 2 or something like that, over a distance which is long compared to the uh, typical radial wavelength, which is the diameter of the duct. And uh, the ratio of those is the small parameter. It's, uh, it's, it's for example, 0.1 or 0.2 or something like that. And then for that matter, we introduce a so-called slowly varying variable. We assume that there are no modal interactions, no reflections, no, uh, no, no things like that, cut on, cut off. And then we assume that our mode has the form of a slowly varying amplitude, the, the, the wave function, multiplied by a slowly varying uh, phase. If k is constant, then what you read here is k times capital X. X is small epsilon, uh, is small x times epsilon, so the, x, uh, the epsilon cancels out, and, and you get just epsilon uh, k times x. Uh, but in this case, we write it in this form, so uh, well, for administrative reasons. Um, now we expand our equation then in uh, powers of epsilon, and to leading order, the p naught happens to become just a mode of our Prickle Brown equation. Uh, of course, it's, it has a parameter of the x, it has an amplitude which is not known yet, but otherwise it's just the known uh, Prigman-Brown equation. 
what is the n? Well, the amplitude n is representing the slow variation of the mode and that can be found from a solvability condition for the next order and after a lot of, well, eventually it's not an understatement, it's a few pages uh, but in the end you get uh, expression for the end, uh, for the n uh, where f and g are complicated but explicit functions of all the parameters. So we have this in explicit form. In the paper you can find uh, the details. Okay, now uh, we can uh, do some tests and uh, since we have no other than the Bahamas, that is the uh, mode matching method, mode matching solution for uniform flow, uh, we start with comparing with Bahamas. Now this is the problem for constant impedance, so one mode and why is that? Well, maybe there is nothing from the varying impedance. So uh, if there is no effect of the varying impedance, then there is nothing to, uh, to see. And um, uh, for the constant impedance, we have this solution for that particular mode. And uh, this is for the linear z. The z varies from uh, this value to that value, so in a vertical direction. And we see that there is definitely an x effect, and we also see that there is definitely the WKB solution is definitely following very closely the uh, numerical Bahama solution. So uh, this is a very good point. They agree well. Epsilon is not extremely small, so it's usable. So that is uh, a good sign. So uh, if we approximate our, our liner by a continuous liner, then uh, the agreement is uh, apparently very favorable. Now this is for a non-uniform velocity, do we have an effect? Bahamas cannot include that, so for Bahamas you have to work with a uniform mean flow, but um, in this case we do have, and we see indeed that there's a strong effect, and the strong effect is due to the uh, refraction of sound in the boundary layer. When the, boundary, the sound tries to refract to the area where the velocity is the lowest, and the low is the uh, width propagating with mean flow, the lowest velocity is of course at the wall and therefore uh, the effect of the uh, mean flow gradient enhances the, uh, the, the attenuation. And you see the difference, so uh, there is definitely a uh, favorable effect of this uh, mean flow and there is definitely a reason to improve Bahamas because Bahamas is not able to capture anything like that. Um, now the Helmholtz resonator case, because that was the original problem. We have Helmholtz resonators, and Helmholtz resonators are an impedance, but they are a little bit unpredictable. They are just cavities, and the cavity behaves in a way that uh, depends on frequency and, and, and maybe other things. So, uh, yeah, we have to deal with the situation as it is. So, we start with a Helmholtz resonator where, oops, where we do not pass resonance, where there's no frequency Halfway, there's no cavity halfway with the resonance frequency which makes the Helmholtz resonator uh, locally um, impedance infinite. And uh, indeed, uh, we find an, uh, a, a remarkable coincidence uh, and agreement with, uh, with Bahamas again, now for uniform flow of course, and, uh, um, and here you see the approximation of the uh, impedance and the stepwise approximation for Bahamas of the impedance and uh, that's very good. But now we have the bad case, and that is when the Helmholtz resonator is at one point in resonance, just because there is, uh, well, uh, there is a frequency which matches with this uh, uh, cavity. And uh, you see here the imaginary part of the impedance. It, uh, it jumps from, uh, well, plus infinity to minus infinity over a very short distance. So the impedance is not satisfying the assumption anymore of a slowly varying z. That's the, the whole issue. And uh, indeed, we see here in Bahamas uh, interaction of, uh, of modes. Uh, the, the first mode and the second mode are clearly interacting here. And that is just not captured by, uh, by WKB. It's, uh, it's as sad as that, but uh, uh, this is not uh, able to capture uh, that sort of thing. And since this is a reasonable normal uh, situation, uh, yeah, there is apparently good reason for uh, 
uh, for, for going on to the mode matching uh, extension. Uh, finally, one case where you have a very strong temperature gradient, is the very strong temperature gradient uh, relevant? Another question you, might, you may ask. Now we can try to solve that because now we have at least a WKB solution that can capture this. Bahamas couldn't do that yet. And we took a temperature profile of, uh, of this type, a sort of tension function. And uh, what you get is, in fact, an, um, two concentric tunnels of uh, different sound speed. Low temperature in the middle, high temperature around. And the, the temperature jump is so, so different that you have effectively in uh, two tunnels. And uh, you, you can see that for the uh, first mode, mu is 1. Uh, you excite uh, essentially only the, the outer tunnel and everything stays inside this outer tunnel and it's very quickly damped because everything is, uh, is captured inside the, uh, the, the, outer, the outer part. Uh, there's no refraction to the inside because the temperature there is much lower. And uh, um, so the attenuation is very high here. The second order mode uh, is mainly excited in the inner part and that has little interaction with the outer part and therefore the attenuation is much slower. So the effect of the uh, two different sound speeds is apparently uh, yeah, very strong and it's worthwhile to include all this into Bahamas. Uh, I take Bahamas as the example because Bahamas was already the, uh, the standard workhorse for NLR and also for uh, Airbus to, uh, to do design calculations for this and uh, they were not sure if everything was uh, captured well enough uh, and indeed you can see that attenuation is much stronger because of these refraction effects than can be uh, predicted by Bahamas. Um, I had to stop halfway. Uh, it's not halfway in the numbers but it's maybe halfway in terms of uh, amount of information. Or is there no? Well, there's uh, no coffee. There's no coffee. <laughs> oh, that, that's why that's why Ines is, is going to look for. Okay. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, maybe I can continue then. Um, can I raise a question? Yes, you can. Uh, if I can answer. Okay. That. <laughs> I was just thinking of the one um, if you had the non-uniformity of, of the mean flow. Uh, Which picture? Yeah, uh, or in your previous. Uh, like the, oh yes, you had uniform mean flow and then you had non-uniform mean flow and you saw that that had an effect. I was, um, which type of non-uniformity is it that you are thinking of? Because you said at the beginning yeah. that you are neglecting it's the boundary a parabolic, layers. A parabolic profile. Yeah, so it's with, really with the, the, the pipe flow, the pipe flow profile that you are thinking uh, Almost. Of. Uh, with, uh, with, with slip at the wall. Mm, yes. So, yeah, so uh, it, it, this, half, this half makes the, the velocity finite at the wall. So it's basically just the, the pro profile, I say. It's a sort of Poisson yeah, flow with yeah. uh, with 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 uh, mm -hmm. uh, turbulent boundary layers at the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now it's it's just something. Uh, we don't pretend to. to <laughs> no, to have no. I was just thinking of where what you had to what you had assumed. I mean, which, which part of the profile you had taken into account? That yeah, yeah. We we found it. We found it uh, more natural to have a monotonic uh, uh, profile, not some bump. But uh, yeah. for temperature, you can have this bump mm -hmm. because it's heated from uh, from from the walls. And that was uh, the other case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we continue now with <coughs> well, we continue now with the next subject. So we had the subject of the solution of the Prima Brown equation, which was a numerical task in its own right which we continue to use as, as a workhorse for the WKB solution, which is essentially an analytical solution for the varying wall. And now we are going to do it, well, as exact as possible by taking the, section, the, uh, the, the, the liners constant per section, and then in each section you calculate the, the whole thing and match them with mode matching. Um, now, a little bit mode matching basics. Uh, I hope and expect that most of you will have an idea of that. 
and some of you, of you have done it themselves, but still maybe it's useful to, to have a small recap. Um, suppose we have a Suppose we have a lot of sections, and suppose we have this alt section, and in this alt section we have uh, pressure given by right running and left running modes. Uh, same for velocity. And suppose that at the interface, the pressure reduces to uh, right running modes and left running modes from the left side, and that has to be continuous with the pressure on the other side, which is given in a similar way. Uh, so what do we do? We have continuity of pressure, and that means that we have this series on the left side and the series on the right side. And we assume, of course, that the number of modes is large enough to represent everything accurately. This is a problem in its own, but we took in the order of 50 modes, and that worked in general. So what we have, we have the modes on the left side, modes on the right side, and then we are going to multiply left and right by some test function. Projection, is that called Galerkin projection, but just multiplication on the left side and on the right side. And uh, we call this function Psi, and Psi can be anything, as long as it's rich enough. Rich enough means enough oscillations. It should be some kind of uh, sines and cosines uh, thing. And uh, normally people take Bessel functions because that is uh, usually rich enough in this uh, context. But in principle, it can be anything. And um, no, yeah. And what, what you do is you uh, the same for continuity of actual velocity. And then you integrate. This uh, inner product means that you integrate. Now this integration gives you a number here, another number there, other number there, other number there. And for uh, uh, Every cross section you, you get uh, this and so in the end you get a matrix, a linear system that has to be solved of right running, left running, right running, left running modes, uh, all filled with these inner products. And these matrix entries are inner products given in a way like this for example, but that of course it's not a law. You can take another inner product if you like, but uh, in this case, this is the common inner product. And uh, um, for non-uniform flow, which we are dealing with here, these P's are solutions of the prigg brown equation, and so they have to be determined numerically. So that is already a numerical exercise one, including the error. And all inner products have to be determined at all interfaces by product term. So you have to, uh, to integrate step by step and then do it accurately enough but since the p's and the psi's are oscillatory inherently oscillatory other, otherwise they cannot be modes you get for the uh, higher orders when you have a lot of oscillations you get an integration over a lot of oscillations and well you know that when you integrate to something which is almost zero uh, but the numbers are big uh, then you need a very high resolution to get accurate answers so you get numerical problems especially for the higher or modes because of the oscillatory uh, uh, properties. And we don't like that. Because for this oscillation problem, you need a much higher accuracy of this pressure, of this P, than you need otherwise. So what, what to do? You calculate them, and only for the inner products you have to calculate again for, with much higher accuracy. You would like to use them with one accuracy for all. That would be nice, but not for the quadrature only. So that was a little bit disturbing, at least. So we have a problem that computing <coughs> inner product numerically is expensive and less accurate, at least for the higher order. And the one million euro, dollar if you like, uh, question is, can we find closed form expressions for the inner products? Because if we can find closed form expressions for this, like with the Bessel functions, then we are done. Then we have no problem with the integration and so on. So we just plug in the number and that's it. And the number is as accurate as the, the number, uh, as the accuracy of, uh, of the numerical process to get these modes in the first place. Now, the answer is no. We cannot find closed form expressions for the inner product. But can we find closed form expressions for an other inner product? So we don't live with this sort of inner product, but we change it a little bit, well, uh, a lot, I mean, then the answer is yes. 
this is not trivial, um, but uh, it's the summary of what comes next. Now, to step back and see where we are, I summarize the new matching method. So, the new matching, this is what comes after this. It's not a summary afterwards, but a summary before. Uh, we have the classical matching method where you integrate just the product of two functions numerically. The new ma mode matching method is that you integrate another inner product, which I donate, uh, denote with a uh, rectangular, uh, well, with these uh, pointed uh, angles. And the classical is called classical mode matching, and the new one is called bilinear, bilinear mode matching. And why called bilinear? Well, it is not exactly an inner product, but it is at least a bilinear yeah, mode, form. So, lacking a better word, we call it bilinear. But it is almost an inner product, I can already reveal that. And, uh, and for that, here we use Bessel functions, and here we use something else. In fact, we use the mode themselves, which is much more convenient, of course, in the end. Uh, we get integrals here and we get something more complicated on the right side and this can only be done by quadrature and here we have an explicit result. An explicit result that can be just taken from the calculation of P, the numerical calculation that we had already. So we don't have to do any calculations anymore except for taking the, the numbers in the right order. So uh, this is expensive and less accurate and this is cheap and accurate. Now, how did we do that? Um, I'm not going to tell it in detail because that can be found in the big paper, but I tried to explain it with a, well, a toy problem, as they call it, uh, a little bit simplified problem. And the prototype example of the generalized Crippen-Brown -Brown problem is just the Helmholtz equation. So the equation for a mode on a cross section is for everything symmetric and cylindrical and, and what have you. It's just a Helmholtz equation. So we have this Helmholtz equation with some number beta. This number beta is of course our eigenvalue k, but it does not have to be an eigenvalue yet. It can be if we satisfy boundary conditions, but it doesn't have to be. So at this stage it's just a number which is related to this k in future. Now, if we take a psi and a phi, both of this type, both satisfying this equation, and we cross multiply this by phi and this by psi, and we subtract, then we get this. These two um, give you this part, and this difference gives you that part. Uh, this is classic, by the way, if you have uh, done certain courses, then maybe you recognize it, but I repeat it for now. And now we integrate. We integrate over the cross-section that we're interested in. For example, the cross-section of the W. And we will find that we have an integral of this product equal to that. But this is, of course, not very interesting because this is much more complicated than this one. Uh, what's the use of this? Well, if you look very carefully, then you see that this can be written as the divergence of this. It's just the same, but it can be written as the divergence. And now you say, aha, we have Gauss here. And we can replace this by an integral over the boundary. And that's a simplification, of course, because the boundary is, is well, it's infinitely less space than the inner surface. So what we have, no, what we have is therefore an inner product for Helmholtz eigenfunctions of the type of the integral across the boundary divided by alpha squared minus beta squared. Uh, what if alpha is beta? You cannot divide that. Well, in that case you have to change a little bit and something similar and I'm not going to explain that here because uh, it would be too much information. You can find it in the paper. It's, sim it's, it's similar, uh, not very similar, but similar enough to call it similar. Um, now for a circular duct, the Helmholtz equation simplifies in some sense to the Bessel equation because for the Helmholtz equation, you have solutions of this type, and uh, uh, the equation of the R part is just the Bessel equation. 
So if you substitute for the phi this solution and for the psi this solution, and you substitute it in, in this integral, then you find that the product of the Bessel function, the uh, exponents cancel out, huh? they become plus and minus, so you have only this. And you get the famous result for the integral of the Bessel functions equal to that. This can be found in the standard books uh, of the 19th and early 20th century. So this is classic, and this is the reason why it was so convenient to use mode matching for constant ducts, because you have all these integrals available. <coughs> um, this is valid for any beta and alpha, but also when beta and alpha is just the eigenvalue that you're interested in when you satisfy the boundary conditions. Uh, again. Now, by analogous manipulations, and again, uh, the three dots stand for a few pages, uh, we can do something similar, but now you have to start at the Euler equation, then you write Euler equation, and then work back. You cannot start at the Prisma Brown equation that are already too much yeah, uh, digested in a way, processed. But by similar manipulations, we can do something for the generalized Prisma Brown equations, but now for an, a, a solution factor P U V W. And uh, similar to the Hamilton e example, you can have this integral, which is, well, it looks a little bit by an int inner product. You have a, the product of the, uh, the P and then the tilde P, uh, U and the tilde P. P is one and tilde is another solution. And, uh, and so on. And that gives you this expression. And this expression is explicitly available on the border. If you know that on the border, then you have this expression. Of course, you do not know it on the border, but um, for the circular symmetric uh, geometry, you do something similar, and you write this solution in a, in a Fourier mode, substitute this again in this previous integral, and you find now an integral only in R. So this is the equivalent of the previous one, and this is the equivalent of the product of the Bessel functions. So if you simplify this, you take u is zero and the temperature constant, and this just simplifies to the Bessel functions product. And now you have a value at the border, at the end, nothing more, nothing less, and uh, something similar for the uh, when when you divide by zero. Of course. If you do not work with general solutions but you work with modes, that means that you satisfy also on the boundary conditions such that you have only those discrete set of this case, then you know what the P, you can express V in terms of P according to the wall condition, you can express this V into P, and everything simplifies to uh, something where you only need a P, and you see that uh, this becomes a function of 1 over z. And the interesting part of that is that uh, for hard walls, you get that this becomes 0. Uh, in a product with itself, not. But you get some kind of orthogonality, which is nice because then in certain occasions your diagonals of your matrices become, uh, your, your matrices be become diagonal matrices. And that is nice, that simplifies things again. But just as a remark. And the same, something similar for other special cases. But this is not mm, universally valid, but just to show you what happens. What, oops, to show you what happens when you uh, when you make it explicit for a mode and not just two arbitrary solutions of the equations. Okay, so now we go back. We have this new inner product, which is technically speaking not an inner product, but uh, we call it for just convenience because it simplifies to an inner product if we take the mean flow constant and the temperature. And uh, we are going to compare the classic with the new one. Because maybe the new one is very nice, but leads to nothing. Uh, um, Murphy is everywhere. Uh, also here, maybe we spent uh, half a year of work on nothing. So we compare it with the classic one. The classic is more or less reliable, and so on and so on. So we take the classic mode matching, where we take the inner product with uh, Bessel functions, which works, uh, but we need quadrature. So that is not trivial. 
and expensive. And then we do the bilinear, bilinear map-based mode matching, where we took the other inner product, which is more the extensive one, where we have explicit results, and uh, oops, where we take uh, now for the Psi other modes, which is nice, as I said, because you have them already. So you can just use them two times for the same price. Um, why do we call it building and made best? Because technically it's not an inner product except for flow or for no flow of uniform flow conditions. Uh, no extra calculations uh, since this is in closed form. But we have even more than that, than only no calculations. It's even more than that. So now we have compared three configurations. A configuration of a length of one meter, dia radius of 15 centimeters, that refers, of course, to the original idea of the APU. And uh, hardwall softwall at halfway, 50 modes in both directions. Uh, Helmholtz number varies from uh, 14, 8, 15, and the modes are, in all cases, 5. Temperature constant, and here the temperature varies. Mean flow varies, zero at the wall, non zero at the wall and a uh, strange uh, jump halfway and an impedance which is in all cases constant well uh, halfway and in every case the first mode and the second mode in the last case okay now what do we find for example real part of the pressure uh, this is the picture for the classic mode matching and this is the picture for the linear map based mode matching. and there is with uh, a naked eye no difference, absolutely no difference. Of course, maybe we need a microscope, then we can see a difference. So we took the result over a cross section at uh, an R, uh, at this uh, three and a half centimeters, seven and a half, and a 15 centimeters at the wall is that. And we find the real part of the pressure in both cases. We find the, uh, at all these cases, and uh, Nico, this is an example of uh, what you said never to do. Uh, well, the, the message is that the dotted lines and the continuous lines are always straight on top of each other. In this case, the same for the velocity. In this case, for the radial velocity, it's all the same. Here, zero, and all the same. There's, in general, a perfect match between these. Okay, where can we find a difference? There must be a difference, because it's found in some completely different way. Well, a difference could be, yeah, it's all the same, it's, it's no visible difference. The difference could be, for example, in the energy. When we put the, the duct in a box, and we take the integral over the wall, and then close it at the beginning and the end, and integrate all the energy that comes in, that goes out via the wall and goes out at the exit and we integrate the energy, the power flux then we know that, because power is conserved that this should be zero <coughs> if everything is accurately calculated and all the scattering effects and what have you should turn out to be cancelling each other so the energy is a measure for the accuracy of your calculations and what do we find? we find uh, 10 to the power minus one and a half, minus two, minus four. When we take the number of modes, we increase the number of modes from uh, five to 20 to 40 to 50. And we see that the uh, bilinear map, the red one, is consistently lower than the classic one. So the classic one produces some energy loss compared to the, uh, to the other one. And it co that's consistent and it even goes, it, it, it becomes even more for higher order modes. So the energy balance is better with more mu modes and the bilinear mate performs better than the, than the classic. Question is why? Why is it better? Can we see that? We don't see it from the modes yet. Now for that we go to our last test and that is the edge condition. Edge condition is a condition that the field has to satisfy, uh, but it's very difficult to satisfy a priori, but you can at least do it a posteriori. So you can check if the field 
has no sources of energy at the interface. And it comes to the following. Um, when we assume that the amplitudes vary by some power of n for some negative p, which is reasonable, it has to converge something like a Fourier series, uh, then it means that the logarithm of a is p times logarithm of n. In other words, that log a over log n converges to p for n go to infinity. So we have a number here that should converge to a number when we take more and more modes. And this number should be less than zero to make the amplitude go down. But even more than that, uh, at the interface, at the wall, the boundary condition is discontinuous and the field may be singular, but the power flux around that point should be finite. There should be no source at this edge. And that is what is called the edge co 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 condition. So you have to check, if you do it well, you always have to check if your result satisfies the edge condition. And um, P has to be smaller than minus 1 to have conver uniform convergence and the S condition is satisfying. Okay, well, we had all these modes and we can check that. And uh, do we have a P smaller than minus 1 for our numerical solutions? Well, the answer is, uh, this was for uh, uh, configuration 1, configuration 2, and configuration C. We see that, the, that this ratio goes to a number which is approximately minus 2. Hey, that's fine, so we have convergence. This also goes in con into to some number which is uh, one is 1.8, also much less than minus 1, and this also goes to 1.9 or so. But we also see, so the edge condition is satisfied, check. But what we also see is that the convergence of this PN number reveals inaccuracies of the classic mode amplitudes. We see that the classic mode amplitudes give a strange hump at the end. Here it's very clear, here it's also clear, here it's less clear, but there is also something. So, apparently at the highest n, the classic mode amplitudes are much more inaccurate. And uh, since they are uh, responsible for the highest rills, uh, you do not see it so easily, of course. But here it's revealed from this. Uh, so, uh, the but in your map amplitudes are smoother than a classic one for n to infinity because there are no quadrature inaccuracies for the boundary layer. Uh, and so they are just as exact as the original solution. And this explains the uh, energy behavior, why this is better than that one. So it explains, oops, no, yeah. this difference. Okay, conclusions. Uh, Fridmo Brown was solved numerically by uh, Colnu, which was very successful and very nice. Uh, path following, automatic step size, and favorable comparison with high frequency approximations. So also for the lot of oscillations, it apparently worked. Slowly varying mode approximation, the WKB applied to the APU docs is gives a very good result as long as the Helmholtz liner does not pass a resonance. Unfortunately, it does pass a resonant once in a while, and uh, so there is apparently a need for matching, for mode matching. Now, the classic mode matching for uniform flow and uniform temperature, that goes well. Uh, mode shapes are Bessel functions, inner products are available closed form, goes well. That is Bahamas. So that is standard, and that is something everybody uh, agrees on. But for non-uniform flows, uh, you have to uh, make the inner products numerically, and that is expensive and less accurate. For the billionaire map, the new inner product, uh, we have numerically mode shapes, but closed form expression, so they are just at equal footing of the, uh, the, the original solution. The original solutions and the inner products are constructed on equal footing and are just as accurate. There's no loss of accuracy by the integration. And they are in very good agreement with the classic one, and um, the amplitudes are more accurate. Why is it that the solutions are in very good agreement with the classic one? Why is that important? Well, I tried to explain that in an epilogue. Uh, because since the inner product is not an inner product, we are not sure that it really works. We have no mathematical theory to, 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 to rely on. 
And uh, yeah, that happens more often, but still you have to think of it. The success of the new matching method is in a way too good. It's so good that I didn't believe it in the, in the beginning. At least far better than expected, because the inner product is not a proper inner product, unless the uniform and zero for all. And we cannot be sure that it is able to single out each model contributions. Because the inner product means that, that parts of the boat which is not uh, orthogonal is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to explain in, in a few words, but you need the inner product properties to make sure that uh, uh, all these modes can be singled out. Nevertheless, from the success we can only conclude that it must be almost an inner product. Uh, the modes are all seen and distinguished, which is a surprise on its own. Uh, possibly related to this, but then we go a step further, and I don't want to talk too much, but that's why is it an epilogue. Uh, that is the fact that uh, the set of discrete modes is, strictly speaking, not complete. Um, we cannot produce any solution of the equations by this set. We are missing a little bit of, uh, of spectrum. The spectrum is not complete with only these discrete values, but we have also a piece of continuous spectrum, and they are found in the locus of, uh, of this, uh, this equation. But from the energy result, we can conclude that this part is very small. It's the reason why the energy did not go to zero, but, but flattened off. So that was the uh, part which was missed here. Uh, nevertheless, there is a fine task in functional analysis remaining. Thank you. Thank you, too. And now you have probably no questions, otherwise. <laughs> uh, yes, well, questions. We need help. Yeah, because I was also thinking of this, that this is your main, I guess, your main, you say, error or whatever, that you, can, you don't have a norm, right? Or, yeah. Yes. Uh, so did I understand and correctly the last, or the last bullet, that that is really where you could investigate whether this is a problem or not? Is that what you're thinking as a future work? Um, well, if you... If you construct your your problem such that um, all the common modes are cut off, mm. yeah, so so everything disappears, then the only contribution that there is left over is the contribution from the discrete spectrum, and then the discrete spectrum is not small. So in that kind of situations, you can construct something where. Uh, uh, there is definitely uh, not such a uh, nice uh, agreement in this, uh, but you have to look for it. Yeah. Uh, we, in, in another paper uh, with uh, Ed Bramley, uh, we uh, we constructed that, and you can mm. see that. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, at least in this kind of sort of configurations, it is uh, it is very small, and, and there is yeah. Mm, not an urgent no. need to, to include that, and you can live to a high degree of accuracy with your discrete modes. Mm -hmm. And apparently, but I, I don't know that. I, I have tried, but I'm not, I'm not clever enough in the functional analysis. Uh, apparently, the problem with the inner product being not an inner product is related to the fact that this, this part is missed. But if this part does not exist, then you have an inner product again. Mm. That could be a, a nice explanation why it works so well. I have, yeah, a point yeah. Yes, I had another. Uh, I was thinking when you said that you have this numerical problem with the oscillating part uh, before you uh, showed this uh, BLM matching method, I was thinking is, is it, uh, do you have this um, multi scale analysis? Would that be something to look at, you think? And what is that? That is if you have something which is varying highly in a certain region, you can you can model that to look on the global properties instead. So I was thinking if that would be a way out of your, you know, that you had this highly oscillating... Well, that is what Colnew already does. 
Colnu is, is, is making your, uh, your, your grid uh, at, at places of high, high uh, action uh, yeah. smaller and larger when, the, where, when yes. nothing happens. Yes. So that is already done. Yeah. But the inherent problem is that but Colnu... This is, this is another thing, this is because this, you changed the equation really. So it's not an numerical... It's not that you resolve things, it's just that you, you change the equation. I, it was I, just I an idea. I I, if you have a look on it, if the, there are the, other works. The, 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 problem, the, the problem remains that when you want to integrate highly oscillatory uh, function, mm -hmm. then you need a much higher accuracy to get yes. a relative accuracy yes. uh, than you have available. Yes. So, you so yes. okay, what Gunnar is saying is splitting the solution into a purely sign and an envelope. Yeah, something, uh, yes, in, in a similar manner. So, uh, just to have, to get to see what, if you looked on the global, um, not, if you could take away the, the you know, the small um, fluctuations and model that into something more global. Only, I think that only works when um, you, have an, uh, you have your function available in, uh, in, in infinite accuracy. But the function is already given by a numerical process. Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I know. But then we, 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 <laughs> we, we checked we checked a number of books and there was a <laughs> fundamental problem. But yeah, um, there is an yes. yeah there is room for, for new ideas of course. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was just curious. But uh, yeah. So I, I have the following suggestion. Uh, yes we can talk in the break.